Thank you, uh, Nikhil. Uh, uh, can I share my slides? Uh, and my slides are visible. Yes, sir. And I'm audible, Nikhil. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah. Uh, 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 at the outset, I'll thank the organizers, organizers especially Dr. Uh, uh, Nikhil uh, and Dr. Uh, Amol for inviting me. And uh, thank you, Shruti. That was a nice lecture. So I'll start my uh, talk, and that's regarding perioperative uh, therapy, new adjuvant and adjuvant immunotherapy. And uh, this is a bit of a tricky one, a bit less tricky now, but then also a bit tricky topic. Uh, we have seen many drugs doing uh, do a good job in palliative setting. You put them in adjuvant, uh, they start faltering. We were not certain about what will happen to immunotherapy. Uh, now, at least we have three situations, that's what we'll be talking about, where you have in lung cancer a uh, drug which in uh, one of them, uh, uh, you know, increasing the life, and other two of them controlling the disease, uh, you know, and randomized trial settings. So that becomes important and seeing this data looks like we'll be talking about this more and more as the time goes by. Uh, starting with why we want to talk about it. We want to talk about any treatment. Uh, depending upon if there is unmet need or not, especially when we want to add a new treatment. And what we see here, uh, lung cancer, unfortunately belongs to one of those group of cancer where in stage B patient also, you do have a significant proportion of patient uh, not surviving after two, three or four years. And here the survival data looks good, but if you take stage 1B patient, uh, then also almost 40 percent patient they fail as the uh, time goes by and that you get reflected in here uh, that is for survival but if you take for disease control it becomes uh, you know, around between 60 to 8 60 to 70 percent and a five year almost 68 uh, percent this we are talking about about a very small tumor the moment goes to around stage three uh, we start talking about a five uh, you know two year survival of 55 percent and five-year survival of 36 percent and if you look for disease control rate uh, for these patients almost in stage three uh, 70 percent and beyond patients they start failing and they do fail within two years and that's the reason we want to explore further treatment in this setting uh, there has been a stagnation as far as this uh, stage is concerned for treatment development in last uh, few decades uh, that is beyond adjuvant chemotherapy we didn't have any development you know here in this setting and uh, that's the reason we are excited about knowing that is there something happening in recent past we did have a uh, significant advances uh, that which is people have uh, seen that it has happened in advanced disease that is targeted therapy io we saw that data uh, in the previous uh, talk and the chemo io and also the biomarker driven approach which decides which one will be giving it we also have seen uh, uh, not in indian context but uh, overall, uh, uh, more in the Western context that the screening has shifted. The uh, diagnosis of patients more in early stage, it's a small number, but looks like it has an uh, impact. Uh, uh, I, as I talked about, post-operative cisplatinum-based chemotherapy, which was some time back, uh, which showed that you know, it benefits patients. And all of you can see that these were the trial which came in you know, uh, 2000, early 2000, and subsequently we didn't have much to show for improvement. It does reduce the lung cancer deaths by 6.9% and increase non-lung cancer death by 1.4%. So overall, uh, if you butter it, then it comes out to be around 5% absolute improvement in survival. I always uh, tell my colleagues and my students that remember this 5% is not sacrosanct for every patient you give adjuvant chemotherapy. It may be one to 2% for stage one patients, but if it will be around 13 to 14% or 15% for stage three patients, and if you take N2 disease patients, then it will be different, it will be far more. So it does change depending upon the stage and uh, you know, only 5% remembering is fine, fine, but in the application, I may not give a patient uh, you know, where there is a risk of uh, chemotherapy with a stage 1B patient of uh, tumor of uh, size of four centimeter. But if the patient has N2 disease, then yes, I'll find out ways and means to see that we are able to give them adjuvant chemotherapy because the benefit is substantial. So it is important that 
what kind of patient receives what kind of benefit is important in the setting uh, we have uh, you know known about it now for some time that in adjuvant setting if we give osimertinib to, to the patients who are egf fermentation positive looks like across the stage it benefits and the for disease free survival uh, the uh, the gap between the curve is pretty wide open and we do have this discussion regarding should we wait for os or not but you do have fda label for it and you have a dcgi label for it to be uh, used in the clinic and i think yes patient do deserve to be talked about this treatment and yes finally they are to choose uh, uh you know we talk about checkpoint inhibitor but as far as immunotherapy is concerned people have tried uh, others uh, you know uh, other immunotherapy this is one of the protocol where i was also a part of it and there was a huge anticipation for mage uh, you know a3 uh, uh, you know as a, a, a vaccine to be used in this setting to hope that uh, you know it will improve outcome uh, it turned out to be that it was uh, a let down not only in melanoma also in lung cancer and you can see the data here so that time it didn't work new adjuvant chemotherapy uh, there has been a randomized trial comparing it apart from that we do have indirect uh, you know meta analysis which has compared the new adjuvant chemotherapy versus adjuvant chemotherapy in lung cancer and it appears whichever you do it give it uh, the benefit looks uh, similar uh, suggesting that in the patient who is who is going to receive adjuvant chemotherapy if you are giving the treatment in new adjuvant chemotherapy you are giving the similar kind of treatment with a similar benefit for these patients do we have uh, theoretical advantages for new adjuvant immunotherapy uh, yes uh, that appears that we do have uh, we do want when we give immunotherapy that there is a tumor inside uh, ho hoping that high antigen load uh, uh, which releases from the dying uh, you know uh, untreated uh, tumors that uh, you know may allow better priming of immune system immune system is fit because we have not given any other therapy no significant clonal evaluation has happened after treatment which which can happen after adjuvant therapy or after the initial treatment local treatment what we give opportunity to accurately study the effects of io uh, which happens uh, more if you are giving the treatment and then you have a tissue to analyze ability to assess the efficacy of the therapy and also uh, one important one shortens the time frame for completion of the trial because you do get early surrogate marker and we will see about it in lung cancer also new adjuvant immunomonotherapy there are many of them and what it tells you that uh, what we see in the scan uh, not necessarily matches in the tissue what we see and the tissue what we see that you do have pathological response rate in by and large single to uh, you know uh, double digits but major pathological response which has got varying uh, definitions but if we remember a simpler one that less than 10% of the viable tissue it goes pretty high and it has gone up to around 45 46% which is encouraging the moment we add chemotherapy to immunotherapy and what we observe here that ct scan uh, when they compared with pathological response again the discordance remains but the pathological response in, increases what we have seen with uh, you know uh, a, a single agent immunotherapy or immunotherapy alone and also the major pathological response becomes substantial and that starts looking very promising and when we see this data as compared to chemotherapy what we have known then we know that there is something promising here this led to uh, you know this checkpoint uh, 816 study which i'm sure we'll be talking till sometime till we have many more uh, you know phase 3 three trial in this setting which was a phase 3 randomized trial for new adjuvant immunotherapy where the key eligibility criteria was the patient with stage 1b that is 4 cm and more uh, disease to stage 3a ecog from performance status 0 to 1 no egfr and alk mutation positive patient stratified between 3a and others pdl1 less than and more than 1 and you know gender major uh, the primary endpoint was pathological cr and event free survival and both of them were primary endpoint we have we have all the regular secondary endpoint which are important some of them is available some of them will be waiting for in the design patient received immunotherapy that is three cycles with chemotherapy again important to remember is it's only three cycles of immunotherapy which all we want especially in the context for treating the patient and also the cost which becomes a major factor in our country compared to chemotherapy in these patients and they were uh, uh, under they underwent radiological evaluation then underwent surgery within six weeks of the treatment these were the patients good number of patients that is 358 
179 in uh, nivoplast chemotherapy arm, 179 in chemotherapy arm. Uh, almost all of them received new adjuvant, you know, uh, nivoplast chemotherapy, that's 98%, completed 94%. And what we see finally, 83% patient received underwent surgery. In the chemo arm, 98% received new adjuvant chemotherapy, completed 85% in all probability because of the side effects of progressive disease. And finally, 75% of the patient underwent definitive surgery in these patients. And these are various reasons why they, they underwent surgery, highlighting that this is one of the issues which comes in lung cancer. And if you, you will see in almost all new adjuvant trial that you do have a group of patients who don't undergo surgery after this treatment. This is the pathological response rate. And if you see all the stages wise, it appears the pathological response rate was higher if immunotherapy was added to chemotherapy as compared to chemotherapy. And in absolute number, it was 25% compared to 2.2% in chemotherapy alone, arm, suggesting that immunotherapy plus chemotherapy was better. As far as the pathological response is concerned, and that was a primary endpoint. But what we want to see that we want to see the data in many ways to see that what we saw for primary endpoint is true or not. And this is a good waterfall plot, which suggests what we see the amount of the patient where you had the depth of the response as compared to the patient who received chemotherapy. Here it is immunotherapy plus chemotherapy. It is ob obvious that it was far higher for patient receiving immunotherapy plus chemotherapy. So what it means that med median residual viber tumor, if they, what, when they saw it, it appeared that it was 28 and 8% in stage one, uh, one, uh, uh, one and two and uh, you know, three as comment compared to 79 and uh, no, 70 percent in the patients receiving chemotherapy alone in stage one two uh, you know, as compared to stage three so a big difference in the viral tumor which is left out after giving this treatment so sure this was something uh, which was promising as far as the surgery is concerned looked like it was fairly well balanced in both the arm as far as the type of surgery was concerned these were the patients where uh, if you see the R0, R1 and R2 resection, they were similar in both treatment arm. And the number of lymph nodes was dissected was also similar in both arm, suggesting that kind of surgery done could not have impacted the outcome what we got. 90 day surgery related complication. It also appears that in both arm it was similar, some differences, but doesn't appear that new, uh, uh, you know, immunotherapy is increasing as far as the surgery is concerned in, uh, you know, uh, 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 in this arm of patients who receive uh, 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 immunochemotherapy. Uh, this is the uh, latest news on this study and which everyone was waiting for. That is, does the pathological response impact the event-free survival? And it does appear the event-free survival was 31.6 months in the patient receiving immunotherapy plus chemotherapy as compared to 20.8 months in those receiving chemotherapy. And I think this is a welcome news with hazard ratio 0.63 and which was statistically significant and looks like clinically meaningful. I'm sure we will all want to wait for and want to know what is the overall survival. Based on this, US FDA has given approval for use of this treatment in this setting. And I think so now we do have a dilemma about what do we do in this setting when you have adjuvant immunotherapy and new adjuvant immunotherapy approved in the similar setting in for these patients. But one of the advantage, what we have seen, it is there that in these patients, you do have a, uh, you, know, uh, 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 no, you can give only three cycles of immunotherapy and get away with it. And again, uh, which I talked about, does this uh, you know, uh, ensure that we will have an uh, you know, OS benefit? We don't know. We need to watch for it. Second study that is adjuvant immunotherapy in this setting. This is Empower 010. This has been talked about more. And what has happened in this, in the same group of patients, what we saw in the uh, new adjuvant setting, after chemotherapy, they were given atezolizumab versus best supportive care and with the primary endpoint DFS and with those regular secondary endpoint. These were the kind of the, uh, data analysis was planned. That is a uh, hierarchical analysis one by one. If it is positive, people went going down to analyze the whole cohort. Initial was more than 1% or 1% of PDL1 in stage 2 and 3A patients. These were the baseline characteristics. Looks like fairly well balanced. And in the primary endpoint for the first hierarchical analysis, it was positive, statistically and clinically meaningful. It appears in the subgroup analysis, it is positive in most of the patient, but for EGFR-ALK, 
not necessarily because this is uh, one of the uh, an earlier presentation i have got the slide but if you take the final publication then for egfr mutation positive and alk mutation positive patient it appears the diamond is on the uh, you know one so looks like they may not benefit one of the another aspect is what happens to the patients with a uh, 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 different subgroup of uh, you know uh, uh, you know of uh, pdl1 positivity this is the second analysis that is all randomized patient for stage 2 and through 3 and again it appears clinically and statistically meaningful again highlighting that yes it appears in all subgroup uh, you do have a benefit but if you take egfr al and mm, tc less than 1% looks like they may not benefit the important question here is not tc more than or equal to 1% the important question is what happens if you sub uh, subdivide between more than 1% and less than 50% and that subgroup of patient what happens this is overall a uh, whole group of patients that is stage one also included here it appears uh, in the usual term uh, uh, you know statistically meaningful but as far as this study was concerned this has not crossed the significance of boundary at this interim dfs analysis so people are waiting for further analysis for this sub uh, this overall cohort of the patients this is the overall survival data looks like tc one percent and more than one percent diversion starts happening but in others, as this moment doesn't look like di diversion is happening, so we need to wait for more data as far as this outcome is concerned. Safety looks meaningful. Uh, I know uh, it looks like it is safe to give if we are careful. But yes, we do have almost 18% of the patient where you have to discontinue this treatment if the side effect is there, and that should be at the back of the mind. Coming to stage three patient, chemo radiation is better than radiation. Dose escalation for radiotherapy doesn't help. And we know of uh, this data for a long time. Uh, that is four-year survival, better for uh, patients receiving uh, 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 chemo radiation followed by immunotherapy, that's drivalumab, as compared to only giving uh, uh, no, chemo radiation here. And what I want to highlight for people here is that 36% is a subgroup of patients who have received uh, uh, no, uh, immunotherapy subsequently when they have progressed. It would have been important to see that if this was not there, if they have not received any immunotherapy, what would have been the curve? And that would have highlighted more about the role of this immunotherapy in this setting uh, know, uh, 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 as far as these patients are concerned. There are some uh, unanswered questions. PDL1 testing was not required in this study, so not every patient had it. PDL1 status was determined before chemo radiation, so post chemo radiation is not feasible, but we all want to know what will happen if you do it. Cutoff of 1% was analysis done by as it was asked by EMA, do we really need to uh, uh, no, talk about it or we can forget it? Uh, but as far as the data is concerned, looks like it's not tough to forget. And people do want to know that if immunotherapy can be given with, concurrently with chemo radiation or not. There are three studies. Looks like it's safer to do it, but we are waiting for outcome of these data. So with these data, uh, uh, the, the question, we know that it is useful in our, uh, no, our patients, but remaining questions are, PDL1 negative patients, what happens? What is the optimal duration of the treatment? Uh, we give it for a year. Is that enough? Sequential chemoradiotherapy, is it uh, good to give this treatment? Is 60 gray the optimal dose or we should be giving the different dose? Chemotherapy free regimen, is it possible? Can we avoid them? And concurrent immunotherapy, which I talked about earlier. There has been some movement on new adjuvant immunotherapy then followed by chemo radiation these patients and this is one of the small uh, you know, study which was done it looks uh, promising uh, you know, in this set uh, in this setting also but the question remains uh, who progress uh, the patient who progresses after uh, new adjuvant immunotherapy then what do we do how many patients failed concurrent chemo radiation and who is best suited for this approach when we select these patients and sure we require a fa uh, require phase 3 randomized to answer these questions there are many phase three uh, study going on new adjuvant setting and there are challenges and also there are many adjuvant trial going on for immunotherapy sure uh, these individual individual trial has made an impact and they are practice changing but i'm sure we'll all be looking for these trials to convince us that as a, a concept this needs to be implemented always uh, these are many questions in both the setting if you have new adjuvant and adjuvant both which one we want to choose? Can we downstage the patients for make them resectable, which we usually don't do it now? What biomarkers by identify the patient where we don't miss those patients who progresses? 
and what happens long in long term risk thank you so much thank you so much sir thank you for taking your time out and uh, coming to this discussion sir i just have one question uh, whenever we talk about edura that is a uh, trial we always talk about egfr exam 19 and exam 21 What happened to the rest of them, sir? Suppose we have got an exon eighteen or exon twenty. So, do we consider Edura as the baseline, or do we consider Durvalumab still because there is no data to that? So, I think so. Apart from uh, you know uh, exon twenty insertions, uh, uh, looks like uh, you know uh, immunotherapy has an issue. Uh, with mutation positive patient uh, in spite of the recent data again uh, the chinese data showing that immunotherapy uh, has a role uh, i thought most likely except for ab abcp we won't be able to show that immunotherapy really works in mutation positive patient but for egfr mutation positive patient there was a chinese study uh, of immunotherapy again with uh, bevacizumab with chemotherapy and it showed a significant benefit so looks like this not out Uh, for ALK looks like it is out, but not for EGFR. Uh, but if I have exon 18, the kind of data uh, where what we have seen with Adora, and that's why I always say once your concept uh, keeps getting proven, so we can debate today. If I have another trial like Adora, most likely we won't be talking about it. I'll give you an example about it. Uh, EGFR mutation positive patient data for PS34 in palliative setting is hardly any, but in one or two the kind of benefit what we have seen. you have been nccn guideline without a single reference they gave it that it should be given so uh, adura the kind of benefit we have seen uh, i'll prefer that because there is a issue regarding the benefit of uh, immunotherapy uh, in that setting uh, but if we have one or two more trial showing the benefit like what we have seen with adura maybe with exon 19 and 20 21 only but that concept being seen more than once uh, people will be very hesitant in uh, you know Uh, bartering with uh, this with uh, you know immunotherapy but your question is uh, valid uh, maybe i'll be proven wrong because many times uh, uh, you know we try to extrapolate and we end up having egg on the face and that's the reason i wait for a bit of a concept i let the concept be seen more than once <coughs> thank you sir if there are no further questions uh